Hi, this is Stephen Cherry for Radio Spectrum. In 2014, two Google engineers writing in the pages of IEEE Spectrum noted that if all power plants and industrial facilities switch over to zero carbon energy sources right now, we'll still be left with a ruinous amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. It would take centuries for atmospheric levels to return to normal, which means centuries of warming and instability. Citing the work of climatologist James Hansen, they continued, to bring levels down below the safety threshold, Hansen's models show that we must not only cease emitting CO2 as soon as possible, but also actively remove the gas from the air and store the carbon in a stable form. One alternative is to grab carbon dioxide as it's produced and stuff it underground or elsewhere. People have been talking about CSS, which alternatively stands for carbon capture and storage or carbon capture and sequestration for well over a decade. But you can look around, for example, at ExxonMobil's website and see what progress hasn't been made. In fact, in 2015, a bunch of mostly Canadian energy producers decided on a different route. They went to the XPRIZE people and funded what came to be called the Carbon XPRIZE to, as a Spectrum article at the time said, turn CO2 molecules into products with higher added value. In 2018, the XPRIZE announced 10 finalists who divvied up a $5 million incremental prize. The prize timeline called for five teams each to begin an operational phase in two locations, one in Wyoming and the other in Alberta, culminating in a $20 million grand prize. And then the coronavirus hit, rebooting the prize timeline. One of the more unlikely finalists emerged from the hipsterish Bushwick neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York. Their solution to climate change? Vodka. Yes, vodka. The finalist, which calls itself the Air Company, takes carbon dioxide that has been liquefied and distills it into ethanol and then fine-tunes it into vodka. The resulting product is, the company claims, not only carbon neutral, but carbon negative. The scientific half of the founding duo of the Air Company is Stafford Sheehan. Staff, as he's known, has had two startups under his belt by the time he graduated from Boston College. He started his next venture while in graduate school at Yale. He's a prolific researcher, but he's determined to find commercially viable ways to reduce the carbon in the air. And he's my guest today via Skype. Staff, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much for having me, Stephen. Staff, I'm sure people have been teasing you that maybe vodka doesn't solve the problem of climate change entirely, but it can make us forget it for a while. But in serious engineering terms, the air company process seems a remarkable advance. Uh, talk us through it. it. It starts with liquefied carbon dioxide. Yeah, happy to. So we use liquefied carbon dioxide because we source it off-site in Bushwick. But really, we can just feed any sort of carbon dioxide into our system. We combine the carbon dioxide with water by first splitting the water into hydrogen and oxygen. The water is H2O, so we use what's called an electrolyzer to split water into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, and then combine the hydrogen together with carbon dioxide in a reactor over proprietary catalysts that myself and my coworkers developed over the course of the last several years. And that produces a mixture of ethanol and water that we then distill to make a very, very clean and very, very pure vodka. Your claim that the product is carbon negative is based on a life cycle analysis. The calculation starts with an initial minus of the amount of carbon you take out of the atmosphere. Uh, and then we start adding back the carbon and carbon equivalents needed to get it into a bottle and onto the shelf of a hipster bar. That first step where your supplier takes carbon out of the atmosphere, puts it into liquefied form, and then delivers it to your distillery, that puts about 10% of the, that carbon back into the atmosphere? Yeah, 10 to 20%. When a, a ton of carbon dioxide arrives in liquid form at our Bushwick facility, we assume that it took 200 kilograms of CO2 emitted. Uh, not only for the capture of the carbon dioxide, most of the carbon dioxide that we get uh, actually comes from fuel ethanol fermentation. 
So we take the carbon dioxide emissions of the existing ethanol industry and we're turning that into a higher purity ethanol. But it's captured from those facilities and then it's liquefied and transported to our Bushwick facility. And uh, if you integrate the life cycle carbon emissions of all of the equipment, all the steel, all of the transportation, uh, every part of that process, uh, then you uh, you get about a maximum life cycle CO2 emissions for the carbon dioxide of 200 kilograms per ton. So we still have 800 kilograms to play with at our facility. Another 10% gets eaten up by that uh, electrolysis process. Yeah, the electrolysis process is highly dependent on what sort of electricity you use to power it with. We uh, use a company called Clean Choice, and we're, we work very closely with a number of solar and wind deployers in New York State to make sure that all the electricity that's used at our facility is solar or wind. And if you use wind energy, that's the most carbon-friendly energy source that we have available there. Uh, right now, the mix that we have that's certified through Con Edison is actually very heavily wind and a little bit of solar, but that, see, that was the lowest life cycle intensity electricity that we could get. So we get a, a, it's actually a little bit less than 10% of that is consumed by electrolysis. So the electrolysis is actually quite green uh, as long as you power it with a very low carbon source of electricity. And the distilling process, even though it's solar based, takes maybe another 13% or so? It's in that ballpark. The distilling process is powered by an electric steam boiler. So we use the same electricity that we use to split water to heat our water for the distillation system. So we have a fully electric distillery process. You could say that we've electrified vodka distilling. There's presumably a bit more by way of carbon equivalence when it comes to the bottles the vodka comes in, uh, shipping the vodka to customers and so on. But that seems true of any vodka that ends up on, on the shelf of any bar. And those vodkas also have a carbon-emitting farming process, whether it's potatoes or sugar beets or wheat or whatever, that, that your process sidestep. Yeah. And I think one thing that's really important is electrification aspect. By electrifying our, all of our distillery processes, for example, if you're boiling water using a natural gas boiler, your carbon emissions are going to be much, much higher as compared to boiling water using an electric steam boiler that's powered with wind energy. It seems like if you just poured the vodka down the drain or into the East River, you would be benefiting the environment. I mean, would it be possible to do that on an industrial scale as a form of carbon capture and storage that really works? Yeah, I don't think you'd want to pour good alcohol down the drain in any capacity, just because the alcohol that we make can offset the use of fossil fuel alcohol. So by putting the alcohol that we make, this carbon negative alcohol that we make into the market, that means you have to make less fossil alcohol. And I'm including corn ethanol in that because so many fossil fuels go into its production. But that makes it so that our indirect CO2 uh, utilization is, is very, very high because we're offsetting a very carbon intensive product. Oh, that's interesting. I was thinking that maybe you could earn carbon credits and sell them for more than you might make with having a, you know, another pricey competitor to Grey Goose and Kettle One. The carbon credit system is still very young, especially in the U.S., we also, our technology still has a ways to scale between our Bushwick facility, which is, I would say, a micro distillery and a real bona fide industrial process, which we're, we're working on that right now. Speaking of which, though, it is rather pricey stuff at this point, isn't it? Did I read 65 or $70 a bottle? It's pricey, not only because we pay a premium for our electricity, for renewable electricity, but we also pay a premium for carbon dioxide that has that that only emits uh, 10 to 20 percent of the, the carbon intensity of, of its actual weight. So we pay a lot more for the inputs than is typical. Uh, sustainability costs money. And also we're building these systems. They're R&D systems. And so they're, they're more costly to operate on an R&D scale, on kind of our pilot plant scale. As we scale up, the costs will go down. But at the scales we're at right now, we need to be able to sell a premium product to be able to have a viable business. Now, on top of that, the product has also won a lot of awards that put it in that price category. It's won three gold medals in the three most prestigious blind taste test competitions. And it's won a lot of other spirits and design industry awards that 
enable us to get that cost for it. Well, I'm eager to do my own blind uh, taste testing. Vodka is typically 80 proof, meaning it's 60% water. You and your co-founder went on an epic search for just the right water. That we did. We, we tested over probably over 130 different types of water. We tried to find which one was best to make vodka with using the very, very highly pure ethanol that comes out of our process. And it's a very nuanced thing. Water, uh, by changing things like the mineral content, uh, the pH, um, by changing the very, very small trace impurities in the water that in many cases are good for you, can really change the way the water feels in your mouth and the way that it tastes. And adding alcohol to water just really amplifies that. It lowers the, the boiling point and it makes it more volatile so that it feels different in your mouth. And so different types of water have a different mouthfeel. They have a different taste. We did a lot of research on water to be able to find the right one to mix with our vodka. Did you end up where you started with uh, New York water? Yes. In a, in, a, in, a, in a sense, we are we're very, very close to where we started. I guess we could add your vodka to, the, to a list that New Yorkers would claim includes New York's bagels and New York's pizza as uh, uniquely good because of their water. Bagels, pizza, vodka, yep, hand sanitizer. <laughs> it's a well-balanced diet. So where do things stand with the X Prize? I gather you finally made it to Canada for this operational round, but take us through the journey getting there. So I initially entered the X Prize when it was soliciting for um, its very first submissions. I believe it was 2016. And uh, going through the different stages, we had at the end of 2017, we had very rigorous due diligence on our prototype scale. And we passed through that and got good marks and continuously progressed through to the finals where we are now. Now, of course, uh, coronavirus kind of threw both our team and many other teams for a loop, delaying deployment, especially for us, we're the only American team deploying in Canada. All the other four teams that are deploying at the ACCTC are all Canadian teams. So being the only international team in a time of a global pandemic that, you know, essentially halted all international travel and a lot of international commerce put some substantial barriers in our way. But over the course of the last seven months or so, we've been able to get back on our feet uh, and I'm currently sitting in quarantine in Mississauga, Ontario, getting ready for our factory acceptance test that's scheduled to happen right at the same time as quarantine ends. So we're going to be at the end of this month in uh, landing our skid in Alberta for the finals. And then in November, going through diligence and everything else to prove out its operation and then operating it through the rest of the year. Do I understand that you weren't one of the original 10 finalists named in 2018? No, we were not. We were the runner up. There was a runner up for each track, the Wyoming track and the Alberta track. And ultimately, there were teams that dropped out or merged for, for reasons within their own businesses. We were given the opportunity to rejoin the competition. We decided to take it because it was a good proven ground for our next step of scale. And it provided a lot of infrastructure that allowed us to do that at a reasonable cost, at a reasonable cost for us and at a reasonable cost in terms of our time. Steph, you were previously a co-founder of a startup called Catalytic Innovations. Uh, in fact, you were a 2016 Forbes magazine 30 under 30 uh, because of it. What was it and is it and how did it lead to Air Company and Vodka? For sure. That was a company that I spun out of Yale University along with a professor at Yale, Paul Anastas. We initially targeted making new catalysts for fuel cell and electrolysis industries focusing around the water oxidation reaction. So to turn carbon dioxide or to produce fuel in general uh, using renewable electricity, there are three major things that need to happen. You need to have a very efficient renewable energy source. Trees, for example, use the sun. That's photosynthesis. You have to be able to oxidize water into oxygen gas. And that's why trees breathe out oxygen. And you have to be able to use the protons and electrons that come out of water oxidation to either reduce carbon dioxide or through some other method produce a fuel. So I studied all three of those when I was in graduate school. And upon graduating, I spun out catalytic innovations that focused on the water oxidation reaction and commercializing materials that more efficiently produced oxygen for all of the man-made processes such as metal refining that do that chemistry. 
And that company found its niche in corrosion, anti-corrosion and corrosion protection, because one of the big challenges whenever you're producing oxygen, be it for renewable fuels or be it to produce zinc or to do a handful of different electro refining uh, and electro winning processes in the metal industry, you always have a very serious corrosion problem. Did a lot of work in that industry in catalytic innovations, and they still continue to do work there to this day. You and your current co-founder, Greg Constantine, are a classic match, a technologist, in this case, an electrochemist uh, and a marketer. If this were a movie, you would have met in a bar drinking vodka. And I understand you actually did meet at a bar. Were you drinking vodka? No, we were actually drinking whiskey. (laughs) So I didn't I I actually am not a big fan of vodka pre air company, but it was the product that really gave us the best value proposition where really, really clean, highly pure ethanol is is most important. So I've always been more of a whiskey man myself. And Greg and I met over whiskey in Israel uh, when we were on a trip that was for Forbes. You know, they, they sent us out there because we were both part of their 30 under 30 list. And we became really good friends out there. And then several months later, fast forward, we started Air Company. Air Company's charter makes it look like you would like to go far beyond vodka when it comes to finding useful things to do with CO2. In the very near term, you turned to using your alcohol in a way that contributes to our safety. Yeah, so we um, we had always planned the Air Company, not the Air Vodka Company. We had always planned to go into several different verticals with the ultra-high purity ethanol that we create. And spirits is one of the places where you can realize the value proposition of a very clean and highly pure alcohol very readily. Spirits, fragrance is another one. But down the list a little bit is is sanitizer, specifically hand sanitizer. And when coronavirus hit, we actually pivoted all of our technology because there was a really, uh, really major shortage of sanitizer in New York City. A lot of my friends from graduate school that had kind of more on, gone more on the medical track were telling me that the hospitals that they worked in in New York didn't have any hand sanitizer. And when the hospitals for the nurses and the doctors ran out of hand sanitizer, that, that means you really have, have a shortage. And so we, uh, we pivoted all of our technology to produce sanitizer in March. And for three months after that, we gave it away. We donated it to these hospitals, to the fire department, to NYPD, and to other organizations in the city that needed it most. Yeah, the hand sanitizer, I like to think, is also a very premium product. You can't realize the benefits of the very, very clean and pure ethanol that we use for it as readily as you can with the vodka since you're not tasting it. But we did have to go through kind of all of the facility registrations and that sort of thing to make the sanitizer because it is classified as a drug. So our pilot plant in uh, in Bushwick, which was a converted warehouse, I used to tell people in March that I, I always knew my future was going to be sitting in a dark warehouse in Bushwick making drugs, but you know, never thought that it was actually going to become a reality. So that was in the short term. Uh, you know, by now, you can get sanitizer in every supermarket and Home Depot. What are the longer term prospects for going beyond vodka with this technology? Longer term, we're looking at commodity chemicals, even going on to fuel. So longer term, we're looking at the other verticals where where we can take advantage of the high purity value proposition of our ethanol, like pharmaceuticals as a chemical feedstock, things like that. But then as we scale, we want to be able to make renewable fuel as well from this and renewable chemicals. Ultimately, we want, to, we want to get to world scale with this technology, but we need to take the appropriate steps to get there. And what we're doing now are the stepping stones to scaling it. It seems like if you could locate the distilling operation right at the ethanol plant, you would just be making more ethanol for them with their waste product, avoid a lot of shipping and so forth. It, you would just become a value add to their industry. That is something that we hope to do in the long term. Uh, you know, our current skids are, are fairly small scale where we couldn't take a massive amount of CO2 with them. But as we scale, we do hope to get there gradually when we get to larger scales, like talking about several barrels per day rather than liters per hour, which is the, the scale we're at now. A lot of stuff that you can turn CO2 into. One of the prime examples is calcium carbonate. Carbonate, CO3 minus, CO2 is CO2. You can very easily convert 
carbon dioxide into things like that for building materials. Uh, so for concrete, for different parts of bricks and things like that, there are a lot of different ways to mineralize CO2 as well. Like you can inject it into the, into the ground that will also turn it into carbon-based minerals. Beyond that, as far as more complex chemical conversion goes, the, the list is almost endless. You can make plastics, you can make pharmaceutical materials, you can make all sorts of crazy stuff from CO2. Almost any of the base chemicals that have carbon in them can come from CO2. And in a way, they do come from CO2 because all the petrochemicals that we mine from the ground, they're from photosynthesis that happened over the course of the last two billion years. If you've ever seen the movie Forrest Gump, there's a part in that where Bubba, Gump's buddy in the Vietnam War, talks about all the things you can do with shrimp. And it kind of goes on and on and on. But I could say the same about CO2. You can make plastic, you can make clothes, you can make sneakers, you can make alcohol, you can make any sort of chemical, carbon-based, ethylene, carbon monoxide, formic acid, methanol, ethanol. And the list goes on. Just about any carbon-based chemical you can think of, you can make from CO2. Would it be possible to pull carbon dioxide or out of uh, plastic itself and thereby solve sort of two problems at once? Yeah, you could, you could take plastic and capture the CO2 that's emitted when you either incinerate it or, or you gasify it. That is a strategy that's used in certain places, gasification of waste, municipal waste. It doesn't give you CO2, but it actually gives you something that you can do chemistry with a little more easily. It gives you a syngas, a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So there, there are a lot of different strategies that you can use to convert CO2 into things better for the planet than global warming. If hydrogen is a byproduct of that, you have a ready use for it. Yeah, exactly. So that is one of the many places where we could source feedstock materials for our process. Our process is versatile, and that's one of the big advantages to it. If we get hydrogen as a byproduct of chloralkali production, for example, we can use that instead of having to source a PEM electrolyzer. If our CO2 comes from direct air capture, we can use that. And that means we can place our plants pretty much wherever there is literally air, water, and sunlight. As far as the products that come out, liquid products that are made from CO2 have a big advantage in that they can be transported and they're not as volatile, obviously, as the gases. Well, Steph, it's a remarkable story, one that certainly earned you that XPRIZE finalist berth. We wish you great luck with it, but it seems like your good fortune is self-made and assured in any event to the benefit of the planet. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks very much for having me, Stephen. We've been speaking with Staff Sheehan, co-founder of The Air Company, a Brooklyn startup working to actively undo the toxic effects of global warming. This interview was recorded October 2nd, 2020. Our thanks to Miles of Gotham Podcast Studio for our audio engineering. Our music is by Chad Crouch. Radio Spectrum is brought to you by IEEE Spectrum, the member magazine of the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. For Radio Spectrum, I'm Stephen Cherry.